The Chameleon, a short story written and read by Christopher Peter Fulham. Chapter 1. A burning wave of grey ooze was spilling over the landscape. Jesse began scrambling his way down a ravine, trying not to think about the volcanic churning of the mudslide chasing behind him. His heart pounded as sweat trickled down the lining of his helmet, impossible to wipe away. The heat fogged and obscured his vision from inside the suit as volcanic activity happened all around him. Stumbling into the bottom of the valley, he could make out the shape of his four-wheel rover and the shape of something, someone else. It was the figure of a young girl waving for help. Instinctively, Jesse scooped her up in his arms, climbed into the four-wheeler and keyed the engine. It burst into life kicking dust as it hurtled over the surface of the quickly disintegrating ravine behind them. A sickness ran through him, a guttural panic, as he contemplated the truth of what was happening, the magnitude of the cover-up. In the distance, a bright white light lit up the sky. A cargo ship with the words, The Chameleon, printed across the hull, was getting ready to take off. Jesse pushed the throttle and the four-wheeler screeched through the dust. The engines on the ship began to hover and burn, the cargo bay door closing as it was getting ready to launch. He slid to a stop, leaping off the four-wheeler, radioing for help. Chameleon, come in. Chameleon, open up the main hangar bay. Jesse hurtled towards the cargo bay door, reaching for the manual release lever, but it was too late. The engines roared into life and Jesse was flung backwards away from the ship with a great thunderous force. The ship collapsed its legs inwards and escaped into the atmosphere. All that could be seen was a blurry trail of bright, molten colours. Jesse tumbled through the dirt and muck of the planet's surface, left in the dust to suffer desertion and certain death. Fourteen months later, Jay silently slipped her arms into her shirt and began to button up her blouse. Must be a record, came a voice from the other side of the bed. Leaving already? Michael rolled over to look at his phone. It showed 2.17 a.m. Sitting on the edge of the mattress, Jay flipped her hair so that she could fix up the collar. Silently, she began to collect up her things from the floor. Her swipe pass, her pants, her shoes, a wedding band from the table. She slipped it onto her finger. Michael looked out the window of the chameleon. I wish I had met your husband. As if Jay might not hear him. We could have compared notes. Getting off the bed, Jay firmly replied. This cannot happen again. Michael smiled. My door is always open. Just stop coming through it. Jay left the room without so much as a look in Michael's direction. He rolled onto his side. I sleep better alone anyway. The chameleon was stationed inside a large open-air hangar. Its strangely elongated shape looked rather pronounced in the morning light. It was 9 a.m. and the sun had just peeked its head over the horizon, clearing the buildings in the small valley below. Not far from the hangar, a crowd was forming. Thank you for your resilience, for being brave, for standing here together today. Thank you that you would be witness to the testimonies of these workers and the stories they have brought us. The voice crackled through a megaphone. Jay stood in the warm sunlight, captivated by the pragmatism of the speaker. We must remain united in activism. We are here to pray and stand with the victims whose lives have been unfairly displaced by conditions forced upon them. A figure stepped out of the ship's shadow, peering with two bright blue eyes. He was wearing a dark blue uniform with the acronym ISN printed in yellow on the front of his breast pocket. He held out a mug of coffee. I made too much, he said, gesturing towards Jay. Thank you, Jay politely took the offering from Sam. They both stood sipping quietly as they watched the crowd grow outside a large building with signage, Intergalactic Supply Network, written in big lettering. Together, we can end the systematic destruction of land put a stop to the toxic practices that have led to the deaths of miners. We will fight until there is recognition, until there is compensation for the losses that have been suffered by the machine of progress. 
The crowd shouted in agreement, a sea of angry faces. Word of advice, I wouldn't get too close while we are stationed here, even dressed as you are. Sam gestured to the faded t-shirt that Jay was wearing. It had a big green logo on the back of it, depicting one hand holding another. Written around the outside in a circle was the phrase, humanity's hand, holding on to hope for all of mankind. They might have seen you with us and got the wrong idea. They are just doing what they have to do to be heard, Jay stated. If you say so, Sam sipped his coffee, cringing. I made this too bitter. You can't expect people to just go on living as if nothing happened. As if nothing is happening, Jay stated, pouring out the rest of her coffee indifferently. When there is negligence, there needs to be justice. Sam finished his cup, his eyes narrowing at the crowd. I wasn't being careful once, about a year ago, near a riot just like this one, and it ended up with this. He pointed to a scar across his right eyebrow, clearly defined against the smooth olive skin. Three stitches. Jay shifted her stance uncomfortably, and Sam took the cup back from her before she could protest. I don't know about justice, but I know about people, and all I'm saying is that crowd wants blood. He turned to make his way back inside. I'll arrange for Michael to escort you if you need to get down there. I don't need an escort, Jay replied sharply. Captain's orders. No one goes anywhere alone while we're docked here. Your safety as an observer is our responsibility. Can't you take me? Sam looked momentarily perplexed. I would, but I have to stay here and oversee diagnostic checks before departure. He hesitated. You could always use the communications here if you would prefer. No, I need to get down there in person, she replied. Suit yourself. Sam boarded the chameleon, leaving her to gaze at the unfolding situation below. We demand change. We demand to be heard. The microphone hissed, but it could barely be heard over what now sounded like cheering. 937. Michael pulled up in a four-wheel ranger. Jump on, he said, handing Jay a helmet. It's not roomy, so you'll have to hold on tight. Jay said nothing as she fitted the helmet and saddled up behind Michael. She put her arms around his waist. Let's go already. They drove down the gravel road away from the hangar. The size of the protest had noticeably increased. Many were now holding up signs showing faces of deceased or MIA minors. The words, reform now, written in large red paint. It won't change anything, Michael said, as if reading Jay's mind. There's too much money in it. Not while profiteers like you keep picking up the scraps, Jay stated. If not us, it would be somebody. You think blood money is that appealing to everyone? I come from the colonies, princess. If you don't profit, you beg, he paused. You ever begged for anything? Jay gave no reply. I didn't think so. They pulled up close to the complex near the fence. Jay quickly flung off her helmet and got off the rover. Hey, Jay, look, about last night, what I said. Not interested, Michael, Jay said flatly. I just need to say something. Jay began walking towards the entrance to the ISN complex. Hold on, hold on, hey! Michael ran off to her, grabbing her arm tightly while pulling her towards him. Jay shot around with an icy stare. Let go of me! Michael looked frustrated, hesitated. I'm sorry, he said, dropping her arm. I just wanted to... Assault me? I didn't mean to. Or maybe you just wanted to shame me some more about my marriage. Shit, Jay, I just wanted... At that moment, a large rock flew right between them right past Jay's head. It had come from a teenage boy on the other side of the fence. That got your attention, didn't it, Scab? He called out, staring through the fence. You don't get to wear that shirt. Take it off, right now. He picked up another rock to hurl at her, but found a large obstacle in the way. Michael loomed over the would-be assailant. Go home, little fish. You don't want to get caught up with these fanatics. But Michael's threatening appearance caught the attention of a few other protesters. 
and soon other rocks and garbage were being volleyed over the fence. Dirty scabs! A man cried as he lobbed a drink carton, landing and splashing over the front of Jay's boots. Let's go, Jay said to Michael as she headed inside away from the commotion. Michael reluctantly followed. That's right, run away inside, filthy scabs. The voice trailed off as the entrance closed behind them. UC appointed Odmanson J. Elliot here to see John Rickman, Jay stated, tapping her ID to the panel of the desk. Accepted, Odmanson. However, officer, it appears your clearance will only allow you to get to the guest lounge. The service android gestured towards Michael. Perfect. I'll have a drink while I wait, Ombudsman. He loafed off, thinking about what drinks would be acceptable before 10.30. Probably nothing he wanted. This way. The service android led her to a large meeting room with a table stretching its length. At the end was an older man in his 50s, dressed in a white shirt with a sea green sweater vest watching the protests unfold outside. A United Colonies flag and humanitarian hand symbol were displayed proudly, patched neatly next to each other on the front of the sweater. Jay walked the length of the room and outstretched her hand. John took it warmly in his palm as they sat together. I'm glad to see you, Jay stated. I got here before the rally began. Have you been sleeping? He asked noting the sunken lines under her eyes. Jay recollected the night before, and her eyes flickered to the window. I feel like I should be out there with them, she confided. John nodded understandingly. We have some of our best speakers out there leading them, Jay. The very best. You have nothing to worry about. Jay thought about the stain the drink carton had left on her boots. We don't need violent mobs, John. What we need is government intervention so that nothing like this ever happens again. Maybe, but we can do little to investigate these tragedies without the power of public opinion, John replied. People are angry, Jay. Workers are dying. Scabs and android labor is on the rise. People are angry. They need to be heard. I'm angry, Jay echoed. No one is angrier than me that this needs to be solved diplomatically. It needs to be resolved politically. Your appointment is vital, and I still believe you are best suited for the job. Has that been in question? John paused. The board is a little disappointed that after three months, you have no proof that the ISN has been inappropriately greenlighting core mining projects. Nothing tying the ISN to the misuse of micromachines and no incriminating testimony from the crew. Your reports have been thorough, but some think you lack the required urgency. What would they know about urgency? Jay interrupted. The ISM were making mistakes long before the incident on Black Moon. Well before Jesse's broadcast. A painful expression crossed her face. Jay leaned in. I think I'm onto something, John. You have to let me stay on this. I keep finding reference to... John tapped the inside of her hand aggressively, and she noticed a slip of paper in it. She discreetly unfolded the paper with one hand. Scribbled in cursive writing was the words, Ears everywhere. I vouch for you. Nobody has your unique skills, or has suffered your... He paused. Unique loss. But elections are coming, and if we don't find evidence soon... It'll put an end to the investigation. The ISN are just waiting until we lose access to their records, crew, and vessels so they can return to their old ways. He looked her in the eyes intensely. If there are any plays to be made, any pressure points to push, now is the time. I have convinced the board to keep you on point for one last trip aboard the Chameleon. I won't fail, John. I'll do it for my husband. I'll do it for Jesse. John sat back looking satisfied. Leave nothing unturned.